your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. everybody and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron here on Parex Radio and that song kind of um, scared me a little bit but that actually is a good thing because I'm really excited about tonight's show and it is kind of a little bit scary. Um, the legendary godfather of the paranormal John Zaffis is here with us and we're going to be talking about a subject that we witches get blamed for quite a bit and that's curses. But believe it or not, most witches don't spend the majority of their time cackling around a cauldron and sending out curses left and right. I mean, hey, we've got better things to do. And for those of you who are snickering at the thought, <laughs> um, I think you should all know that everyone sends out curses all the time to some degree, sometimes without even realizing it, because a curse is any expressed wish that some form of adversity or misfortune will befall or attached to some entity, and it could be a person, could be a place, or it could even be an object. For example, you're sitting at home watching the news on TV, and the newscaster makes a comment that you really don't agree with. So you get annoyed, and you yell back at him and say, go to hell. Well, that's a curse. Or you're an employee who's not treated very well by your boss, and they order you to go get them a cup of coffee, So you get the coffee, and on your way back, um, you're staring at that cup, mumbling under your breath, and hoping that they take a big gulp and burn their mouth. Well, that's another curse. 
So anyone can lay a curse on another person, but it's believed that the authority of the person who does it increases its potency and makes it more dangerous. You know, like, like they would say, if a witch does it, or, you know, a priest or something. But also, um, desperate people who have no other recourse to justice are very good at sending out curses. And in fact, deathbed curses are said to be the most potent since all of the cursor's vital energy goes into it. So during medieval times, though, a curse upon you or someone you knew was taken with the utmost seriousness. And back then, just not anybody had the power to bring down a curse on other human beings. So that's where they think, oh, us bad witches and practitioners of the dark art um, had all the power. But in the Dark Ages, um, <clears throat> passing to the Renaissance, the rules changed. And over time, it was assumed that pretty much anyone in the village could get the ear of the devil, or at least one of his minor demons, and put a curse to work. So that's what I'm getting at. Curses have universally been bought, sold, used throughout the centuries, and nobody's completely blameless in the curse department. But, as I also just mentioned, some curses are worse than others, and if anybody knows curses, it's John Zaffis. Hey, John. How are you? How are you doing? That was a fantastic explanation. I love it. Yeah? You're taking notes? Yeah. Yes, I I agree. I agree. (laughs) I studied very, very hard. But, you know, okay, so from a witchy standpoint now, we look at curses as being spells because anything you wish on someone with a strong intent behind it, whether it's good or bad, is considered casting a spell. So what's your definition of a curse? Um, basically when it comes into this, it's been done just like you were explaining for thousands of years. And it is alleged that the strongest curses are casted out by an individual on their deathbed. Mm -hmm. Now with, with a lot of the cursing that, uh, we tie in with, um, the Italians and the Greeks are noted to be the worst ones to actually start putting curses on people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, even to this day, they're they're still, you know, very strong ties with with that in the belief systems of uh, both cultures. Mm -hmm. Now, again, when when doing this, can a curse be put on an object? Absolutely. We, We have, I mean, gosh, one of the most famous ones is the Hope Diamond. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, here again, it holds on to the energy from the person that had cast it towards the item. And it's the same thing with individuals. What people have to remember with uh, these types of scenarios, a lot of times it has to do with the energy of the individual. I don't always necessarily believe that, you know, a hardcore practitioner, you know, someone, you know, a high priest or a witch or, you know, a lot of different people are going to have the capability to do it. But people Mm -hmm. that are very strong with the energies Mm -hmm. are the ones that are more lethal than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's what goes in in spell casting, too. Unless you believe strongly about what you're casting out, it's not going to work. And, you know, we we deal with this uh, continuously where, you know, uh, we have families that have been plagued from generation to generation. And I've seen it where, you know, different types of rituals, uh, religious, non-religious rituals, have actually helped individuals to uh, be able to break something that was casted upon a family. But one, one of the key factors from my perspective on it when researching it, it's uh, important to see if we can find any information out on the curse that was actually done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and but sometimes you don't forget that. <laughs> exa- exactly. I mean, who's going to fess up, right? I mean, right. yeah, it'd be just silly. Now, um, do you believe that all curses are aided by demons, whether the curse-er calls upon them or not? No. Um, I'm a very strong believer in the fact that we could deal with demons, Mm -hmm. we can deal with deities, Mm -hmm. and also jinn. Now, when when talking 
in regards to uh, these different uh, spirits or energy, however you want to refer to them, they all can be called upon. And they all can tie in at different points when cursing is done. What is done is if some of their names are used in different ways and perspectives, they can be actually summoned Mm -hmm. and they can be casted and sent towards a group of individuals or a single individual. Mm Mm-hmm. And you have to be very careful about these things, you know. I mean, so many people inadvertently do things like that without even realizing it. You know, somebody will pick up a book, say a demonology book, and start reading names of demons out loud, not realizing that, hey, you're summoning them. You know, it's kind of like you just put the neon open sign on, right? Well, actually, I look at it from this perspective is that the law of recognition and the law of attraction – these two things come very much into play. And when starting to um, evoke upon you know, uh, some of the names that are out there can give enough recognition where they can actually summons that person, not person, but you know, that, that spirit, and it could start to wreak havoc. Now, does it always mean that it's going to happen right then and there? No, they wait for the perfect opportunity to be able to uh, start doing their deeds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, catching people off guard is a specialty, you know. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's, it is. And and not a good. One. It doesn't have a great reward at the end. Now, um, there's lots of famous curses out there, like um, Tecumseh's curse, where a president is supposed to die in office every 20 years. Um, Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr. put the kibosh on that, since they both did, uh, survived assassination attempts at the time the curse was supposed to take place. But then there's also the Chicago Cubs and the curse of the Billy Goat curse, um, the curse of the Pharaohs, and Hollywood the Superman curse, um, the Hope Diamond curse, as you mentioned. And um, there's a theory, though, that if a person doesn't believe in curses, they can't be affected by them. How do you feel about the non-believers can't be hurt theory? Oh, I disagree. Um, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> uh, you know, I've seen people that don't believe in curses, paranormal, supernatural. They don't believe in anything. And, you know, they'll, they'll start buying, okay, good example, haunted items that could have been cursed or uh, have things that were deliberately attached to them. They'll buy them. They'll have them in their homes, and they'll start to have all kinds of crazy paranormal activity taking place. I'll get a telephone call and go, John, I didn't believe in any of this, but I got this haunted item, and it had a curse done over it and all these crazy things. Now, my life is falling apart. All kinds of crazy things are going on, but I still don't believe in these things. But can I send you the item? Mm. So, you know, (laughs) yeah, yeah, you sit back, and it's like, yeah, a person does not want to accept the fact that these things occur and they can happen, but yet they'll, they'll take that chance and they'll buy these uh, certain types of items. Well, even very good items, uh, Marla. We know there's uh, a lot of good luck uh, amulets and rings and bracelets mm-hmm. and things that, you know, uh, spells have been put on and different mm-hmm. things that uh, – People buy them, they use them, and, you know, sometimes for a positive, but things can also be very negative, too. Well, see, this is the thing that kind of gets me when when people look on the Internet or go into a store and here's an amulet or here's a a crystal or, you know, people that are selling, this is going to do this for you, this is going to do that for you. Um, I worry about that because people will take it home and not do a cleansing on the item. So the intent of whoever made the item or sold the item, and it could have a lot of bad mojo on it, goes directly to you. And Mm -hmm. I think it's really dangerous to do that. And, and, you know, I mean, lay people, for lack of a better term, don't always understand that. You know, there could be somebody out there getting their kicks, cursing all these items and telling you, hey, this is going to make your life so much better, and then sit back vicariously and, and know it won't. So I'm always worried when people buy into those things about, um, here, this is going to change your life. Buy it from me. Because I don't think the right intent is put on it. Well, we're all very trustworthy people. All of us. Unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and, you know, we believe that people are always going to do good things. 
And if a person, you know, should buy an amulet that's out there on, you know, one of the uh, Internet sites, you know, they're trusting Mm -hmm. of that individual that they're putting, you know, some very good positive energy towards that item. Mm -hmm. But you don't know. None of us know that. Exactly. We don't know a lot of times what type of uh, energy could be affiliated with uh, an item that a person will purchase and receive. We don't know the intent of the person behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a lot, a lot of people, you know, can buy something and uh, start wearing it, a piece of jewelry or something, and they just watch their luck go right down the tubes. Mm-hmm. I, I've dealt with many people that have done that. Yeah. Um, we've got so many questions from the chat room coming in. Um, let's address those, and then um, we'll get back to what I was going to pick your brain about. Um, first question is from Rusty, and she wants to know, what about the curse of the evil eye, speaking of Italian curses, and how to counter it? Uh, well, you got to be very cautious. you got to be very careful when people do that. I mean... You know, uh, I'm married into an Italian family, so <laughs> I, I know. So, you know, uh, with that and everything, you got to be very careful with that. But it's like anything else. When, when the energy is sent towards another individual, you have to remember, you have to have that positive reinforcement about yourself. That, that's why I always, you know, jump up on the soapbox today, you know, spirituality. That, that is the foundation of being able to protect yourself. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, somebody's got to go to church and they got to go to synagogue. You know, that's not what I'm talking about when I say spirituality. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to have that foundation of belief in a positive to be able to help protect yourself. And another key element, and it's the hardest thing for each and every one of us to learn and achieve, is to be able to harness and be able to bring that positive energy around you to be able to help protect yourself and to be able to push that negative away from you. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people can learn to understand it from uh, trial and error because, you know, our society especially in the United States, is something that if we can't see it, we can't touch it, it doesn't exist. Right. So, you know, those are key elements, and they're so basic. It's, you know, it's right there, but it's hard, and I understand it. When people get scared and they don't understand something, and realizing that that whole etheric world, spiritual world, exists and these things do happen, I try to equate it to people for an understanding that look at it as energy. Remember, Mm -hmm. energy can never be destroyed, but it can, you know, counter and it can take on many characteristics. And some of those energies have an intelligence to them. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the scary part. Right. We have another question from Karen. She said, okay, she says, people can use a curse for bad things, but can you use it for good things? I would think you could send something out that is good. You know, Marla, I'd like to hear you answer that first. (laughs) All right. Well, my kind of opinion (laughs) is that a curse is a bad thing. And it can't be changed. I mean, cursing by virtue of the name curse, it's not good. Um, From a witchy standpoint... Um, you can put out good things in a spell or from a regular standpoint, you can put things out in a prayer or a wish or a hope. I don't think personally that cursing can be flipped. I agree 150% with you. Yeah, that just, you know, my witchy brain tells me that. All right, now I've got an excellent question from Dave. I think he's doing it to um, really pick your brain well. But he wants to know, if someone who is cursed can inadvertently pass it along to their children? Yes. Um, I'm a very strong um, believer in this. I've seen it happen over the course of years where once a, um, you know, a, a child comes into the family, into the bloodline, it's the same energy. There's a lot of things that tie in. So I do feel very 
positive on making this statement that if you're aware of things like this and you feel, you know, that something needs to be done and you're concerned about it, you should take care of it as soon as you can so that you can break the uh, lineage, so to speak, of uh, certain things occurring and certain things happening. Does it always work? No. A, because a lot of times the key factor is you need to know exactly what was done and how it was done to actually break it. But there are multiple ways to actually have things done uh, to be able to help break the cycle. Mm -hmm. Or maybe at least weaken it temporarily. Well, I, I've seen that happen uh, where things have been weakened. And a lot of times, you know, that's the other thing, too, people have to understand that you, a lot of times you have to keep up on these things from a, a spiritual perspective. Yeah. And it's a battle. It's a continuous battle 24-7 to be able to, you know, help protect yourself, protect your family, and to keep yourself in, in that, on that path, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And, man, that's hard for any of us to be able to do that. Oh, sure it is. We get beaten down <laughs> enough, but you know, you, you do. I mean, I'm I'm like the one who's the cheerleader of protection, and that's not just when you're going out on an investigation, and not just when you're trying to do divination. I, all the time. I, I mean, we have to live that way because there are forces out there that we don't see. A lot of people don't admit to them. A lot of people don't believe in them, but they're there. I believe that. And um, <clears throat> we have to absolutely keep our guard up. That, that's a, a very key element. And that took me a long time to, to understand that because I always felt, okay, well, if I'm not out investigating or not getting involved with anything, do I really need to worry about anything on a positive and spiritual level? And I was like, eh, no. But yes, you do. Yeah, and yeah. That, yeah, that, that's a continuous thing that that's continuously revolving no matter what our circumstances are because when you least expect it that's when they strike exactly <clears throat> i've got a, a kind of an interesting question at least i want to know the answer to this from me um do you think it's possible that any of the people that you've been called in to assist uh, with during an exorcism case were perhaps cursed into being possessed rather than by other means you, you can have situations where that can come into play mm -hmm. um, uh, with the fact that, you know, energies can be cast in many different ways and there can be an association with it. But mm -hmm. the, the majority of the time when people do fall victim to pure possession, they've usually opened up the doors to something. There are those mm -hmm. few exceptions that... You know, I've seen over the course of years where these, these people were totally innocent. They really didn't do anything or I was never able to find anything. But, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of things can come into play when uh, a person's involved with that, with, you know, seeking out help or, you know, asking somebody something because uh, people are going to want to pull from that energy. They're going to want to reinforce that so that mm -hmm. there's very many vulnerable uh Variable, not vulnerable, situations that do take place in, in, in these possession cases. Mm hmm. Yeah. I just, you know, it just kind of struck me as I was writing up questions and everything. I thought, well, it could be, you know. So ask, ask the expert. That's my motto. Um, <laughs> now, many people feel there's no difference between a haunted item or person and a cursed item or person. They believe that one goes hand in hand with the other. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, de de definitely, that's a two-part question. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we deal with cursed items or haunted items, um, are they actually possessed? No. What is done is energy is attached to them, uh, depending on whether you're dealing with human spirit that attaches itself to it, or you, you you know you get involved with ritual items or uh, things, you know that were used in things. I look at both in different uh, categories. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, no, I mean it, it, I don't even put that into the same type of category whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got a museum chock full of items that are haunted, and some possessed, and some cursed. 
And three of the items in your collection caught my eye because they're witchcraft-related pieces. Um, one is the Book of Shadows. Mm-hmm. Another is Mr. Bojo, the poppet. And for those who don't know what a poppet is, in layman's terms, I guess you'd call it a voodoo doll of mm-hmm. sorts. And then there's the idol. Now, I want to talk for a minute about the Book of Shadows because a Book of Shadows is a handwritten collection of spells, um, magical tradition, and also serves as a personal magic journal, magic journal. And it's usually handed down from generation to generation. And, you know, it's kind of like a cookbook for witches in, in mm-hmm. basic terms. And you say this book's description, in, in the book's description, that the related items that came with it and the book were used to cast negative spells. So now I'm going to mess, <clears throat> mess with your brain just a little bit. Is it the book itself that's cursed because it contains black magic? Or is it because during a ritual of some sort, it attracted a negative entity or demon? Because in my way of thinking, something that's merely written down and tucked away is relatively harmless until the spell is cast. That's very true, and I agree. And what most people don't realize, and you had brought that to the forefront, very seldomly will you ever see uh, this type of book ever outside of a family member. This Mm -hmm. particular person, though, um, had decided to just continuously go down a a very dark, black path, so to speak, with practicing things. And um, this wasn't her original book, but a lot of the things that... uh, she had did in there as far as you know uh doing her own spells up and doing different things were such on a negative level that it was quite understandable why when this person had fled this home that these things were left behind uh all the items that are there with it the candles the scarf and the book uh were underneath another person's bed mm. And uh, when they were cleaning, they discovered the things that were underneath, and we were able to tie the pieces together on exactly why the person that remained in the apartment was having so many difficulties. And when reading uh, some of the spells that she uh, actually formulated in there were very, very dark, Marla. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's harmful for, like, obviously read through it, do you think it was harmful for you to even be reading it? Yes and no. Um, When reading something to comprehend it and learn and understand is one thing. But -hmm. if you're looking at something and you start reciting it and you're going over it with not a clear-cut understanding, I think you can leave yourself open you know, for energies to come towards you. That's why I'm very strong, and I, I've said this for many years, you know, reading books on demonology or witchcraft or hauntings or anything, do mm-hmm. I think that there's anything wrong with that? No. It's the intent, and it's the purpose that you're doing it. If you start reciting things out loud and you start playing around with what is written, then you're leaving yourself wide open and vulnerable things. Reading something to gain knowledge for a better understanding, I don't see any harm in that. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and, you know, the the bottom line is, again, people don't realize um, things that they could step into or jump into just by accident, by mistake. And, again, it goes back to protection. Anybody that's dealing with, Anything in the paranormal or metaphysical world has to realize that you have to put that wall up and and keep it there and, and renew it all the time. You know, they think, well, okay, well, let me do the white light one time and I'm good for forever. Ah, you know, yeah. it doesn't work yeah. that way. Yeah. It doesn't work but, that way. But, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate people do think that. And mm-hmm. they don't, you know, uh, realize um, it, it, my daily way of looking at it or probably the way I do, you know, structure things for protection and everything is there's things I do in the morning, there's things I do in the afternoon, there's things I do in the evening, you know, with with um, 
you know, on the on a positive level for protection and you know for that bringing that positive energy around, and that's daily. I mean, you know, you, going out to do an investigation, there, there's sets of different prayers I do. When I leave an investigation, there's sets of prayers that I do. I believe very strongly in the power of, you know, calling upon that positive to be able to help protect yourself. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, people think, well, you have to be a witch to do that, or you have to be, you know, a medium, or you have to be somebody involved. You don't. I mean, praying to God works just as well, you know. I mean... As long as you have a belief in a higher being and you pray to that person and, and ask for protection, it works. You know, I mean, it, it, I don't know, people just, I guess there's a lot of flotsam and jetsam that flies around out there that people just are unaware of and it, it can be dangerous. Um, so I want to hear about some of the items in your collection and, and particularly want to know if um, there's anything in particular there that you're actually afraid of, um, and do you believe that some of these things might be a danger to yourself or others? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like I that. It's covered all bases. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, there really isn't something that I fear. I respect things. I respect a lot of the energies and the different things that are associated with the items. I do there there are set bindings that I've done over all the items that are in the museum. You know, again, whether it's human spirit attachment or could have been used in rituals or different things, you know, but that that is a common practice regardless because to me it's not worth taking the chance because things could trick you. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, a fear, I, I really don't. I, I really can't say that there's uh, an item per se that I fear. Things are creepy to me, you know. They they still creep me out because mm-hmm. I have to, you know, the whole uh, area within the museum where most of all the occult items or the negative items are in one section. The human spirit ones are in another section, and you know, I just have things. Um, in certain areas, but there, there's reasons I do it that way. Um, I, I, again, you know, I, I am very cautious when people are in the museum. You know, I tell them, please don't be touching things. I said they're in cases for a reason. Um, you know, but a lot of times people are going to tempt fate, as we know. Curiosity gets the best to people. So you you got to be very guarded and very careful because they don't believe those things can happen or they're going to have any type of uh, paranormal experience. And, mm-hmm. you know, again, that's up to an individual. You know, I warn a person. I give them the information and, you know, uh, do the best I can, you know, to, to caution individuals when they do come in. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of... of- cautioning um, we've got a question from Reverend Tim and it was something I actually I was thinking about as well when I was looking at your website for the museum um, he wants to know why are there so many clowns in your collection what is it about clowns you know it, it's it's it, it's unique you know why because clowns the original intent with them they were gestures and mm-hmm. you know they, they go back to medieval times and they were around to make people laugh and have a good time and over the course of time, they, de- they just develop that stigma about them, that they're just pure evil. And, you know, they terrify people and they scare people. But, again, when you're looking at it, when people do things or practice things, it's a perfect item to send energy towards. Mm-hmm. Because people are already going to be frightened of the item. Therefore, the energy is getting thrown off of the individual. Then the energy that's associated, you know, with some of those items, man, you know, you you do that connection between the item and the person, and it activates some of the things that are going to occur. So clowns really do get a bad rap, I'll tell you. Oh, they're creepy. They do. I mean, you know, most people, if you you talk about clowns, they go, oh, they creep me out, or, oh, clowns are bad, you know. Um, Yeah. And and it, it's they're not all they're cracked up to be. I mean, I I mean when I was a kid, there was this this game uh, game show, 
It was a morning show for kids. It was Chucko the Clown. And I was dead scared of Chucko. He was a birthday clown. He was a happy clown. And one of my friends had a birthday party, and we all went to the studio to see Chucko. And I sat there, and I was five years old, and I couldn't stop crying. And to make matters worse, Chucko picked me up. This was back in the days of live television, because I guess he wanted to shut me up. That was the worst (laughs) thing he could have done. He picked me up. And on camera, I'm throwing a tantrum and screaming. I mean, you know, and here's this happy little birthday clown. So what are you going to do? I mean, clowns are just... Clowns and witches both get bad raps. It's really not a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you Um, know, again, you know, Marla, you just touched on something. And, you know, that that's such a a weird misconception with people. You know, when you start saying different things about, uh, you know, witchcraft or witches and demonologist and some of these different things you know, even demonology basically has a very bad stigma with it also because yeah. for many years people you know i would never ever say i was a demonologist they go oh, you're a satan worshiper <laughs> well you know yeah, and, and witches get the same thing but oh, you yeah. know people people need to read and educate themselves on a lot of the things that that tie in with so many uh, uh, of the aspects of our work that each and every one of us do. I mean, you know, fortunately today, I think the demonology title is something that, you know, the pressure has lifted off of where, mm-hmm. you know, not all of us are running around conjuring up Satan. So, you know, <laughs> but, you know, and, and which is still, you know, they have that, you know, it, it, it's a terrible thing because I know a lot of witches. I'm good friends with a lot of witches, and they're not interested in hurting nobody. Mm-mm. No, yeah. we're sweet and adorable for the most part. I mean, there's bad in every group, you know, but no overall, I mean, yeah. there's just this bad rap that, that comes down on us. And and to the minute any word has demon in it, you know, you're going to get slammed too. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Have uh, good demonologists, you have bad demonologists. You got good witches, you got bad witches. Mm-hmm. And that brings up a question. Um, okay, so witches have been known for thousands and thousands of years. Where did the term demonologist come from, and how long has that been around? Oh, my gosh. Uh, demonology dates way back. I mean, gosh. um, goes back to uh, Egyptian times and the Greek times and where it tied in where basically a, a demonologist was one that knew about the deities and um, you know, tied in with like, oh gosh, Marla, I, I, so many things tied in with it, uh, sorcery and, you know, uh, crystal mancy, there, there's so many things that tied in thousands of years ago with, mm-hmm. quote-unquote, the demonology aspect of it. But it really, the, the, the name really came in when organized r- religions started really coming to the forefront. Mm-hmm. And when it came into the Christianity part of it, that's where it became very popular with having, you know, the good demonologists that were associated, you know, with the Christianity end of it. But, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, a demonologist, uh, the term, my gosh, it, it just dates back, oh, as far back as I'm aware of, going back to Egyptian times and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, at that point in level with uh, the Greeks and everybody, too. Yeah, I just, you know, it seems like it's a term that is recent and current because um, I guess... You know, demonologists like witches are coming out of the closet more now. And so it, it's more of a term of popular culture. And you don't think of them, you know, maybe they were, I don't know, seers, soothsayers, but probably <clears throat> back in ancient times, demonologists were lumped together with witches um, because they were all a little bit different than the norm, you know, and, and all probably looked down their noses at by people because it was all dealing with consorting with the devil well here again yeah you know um like i said uh, looking at it from so many different perspectives and i think that's why when quote-unquote organized religion 
came into the forefront, that's when that division took place with trying, mm-hmm. you know, to decipher what was good, what was bad. And, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's a bizarre twist when, when you look at a lot of these different uh, perspectives of it, especially with the demonology field, because when you go way back and you look at that and how it, it, it integrated into organized religion, well, how come they didn't? Org- how come they didn't infiltrate the witches? Mm-hmm. Well, we just got kicked right out when Christianity came in. We—that's when we, you know, I've said this before, but <clears throat> pagans and and witches back in the early times the witches were thought to be the wise women they were the ones that knew the herbs and they could prescribe medicine and they were there for childbirth and everything um and then when christianity came in um we kind of got turned into the ones that consort with the devil and do his bidding and all that because the church wanted um people on their side not that there's sides but that's you know kind of the way it happened Mm -hmm. um so, you know, it was just one of those things that when when the whole scheme of things turns around, you just kind of, some people get lost by the wayside, and then there's a lot of misunderstanding. And I'm sure today, I mean, people in terms of, of what you're called um, consider demonologists Satanists. Because demons mm-hmm. and Satan, the word is the same. So, you know, you've got a pox on you before you get started sometimes with a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, here again, you know, uh, within, you know, the different uh, uh, belief systems out there, uh, within, you know, Satanism and, and devil worshiping and a lot of those uh, organized uh, situations, they have demonologists within, within those groups. You know, mm-hmm. again, uh, people have to have an understanding of it and a, a, a grasp on what these different uh, belief systems are, how they integrate, what they do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's difficult for people on the outside to understand when you're involved with the paranormal field, mm-hmm. you know, studying all these different aspects and the different uh, belief systems and practices out there is that, you know, I'm not out there looking at it and going, oh, you know, they're a devil worshiper, they're a devil worshiper. That's their choice. And I respect what people do. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if a person needs help with something, you know, all right, then I'm going to look at that differently. But, you know, what a person practices to do, I don't always necessarily think somebody should judge them by that. Mm-mm. No. But we're a very judgmental society, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to overlook. Um, I just got another question from the chat room from Glenn, and he's asking about buildings that have been cursed. Do you know of any? Do you have any opinions about that? Oh, they, they, most uh, different types of uh, your elite buildings, especially years ago, there was... Uh, alleged all kinds of different practices that would take place in them and you'd have different types of ceremonies that were done in them and again uh, some of your your major buildings I mean look at the uh, the Twin Towers everybody swears up and down they were cursed Mm -hmm. so you know uh, yeah I mean uh, Empire State Building uh, a a lot of your very elite buildings uh, people claim that there is definitely curses that were per, put on a lot of these different types of buildings. Mm-hmm. For various reasons. Or could it also be perhaps that what stood before the building was a cursed area? Absolutely. And, I mean, that, and these, yeah. you, the you energy just sticks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, it, this might sound very crude, but, you know... Um, the area where the towers were, I, I, I personally, I wish they would just fill that in with dirt, plant trees there, turn it into a park. Because mm-hmm. now that, is, to me, is very cursed soil. Mm-hmm. And anything that probably goes up on there is always going to have a tremendous amount of issues with it. Mm-hmm. So, you mm-hmm. know, yeah, there are areas I think that, you know, the land per se... 
You know, it might not have originally started out with just that little area being cursed, but do I think that that area is cursed now? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's a lot of negative energy there, and, and I personally believe there's a lot of lost souls there because it just happened too fast, and I don't think everybody crossed over. But no. that's just my opinion. I mean, you know, I hope they did. But it's just one of those one of those bad places. We have a building um, on Hollywood Boulevard, a beautiful bank building, you know, very Art Deco from the 1920s. And we went to do an investigation in the basement because um, the the manager that works and has his office down there was having all kinds of weirdness happening. Um, but when we got there, you know, uh, I said, you know, I walked in, I said, this building, and it's it's a high rise, it's not, you know, a small little place. I said, this place feels so empty, What what's up? And this is like prime Hollywood property, you know, right next to the Kodak Theater. Um, and at the time, he said, we have two tenants. This is a 14-story building, and we have two tenants. He said, people move in and move out just as quickly, and he says, we don't have a clue why. And I'm thinking, ooh, there's kind of bad stuff going on around here or something. I mean, you know, it, it did feel um, there was a lot of activity that we found going on there. But can you imagine a 14-story building in Hollywood has two tenants? I mean, there's got to well, be something going on there. Yeah, well, I, I had found over over the course of years, I can't get over how superstitious Hollywood is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, it, it amazes me that, um, you know, uh, Hollywood, you know, it, it, you just don't look at it from that perspective. But, I mean, my goodness, uh, they can get, you know, uh, it, they get spooked so easily with being concerned that somebody, you know, could be cursing a project or cursing mm -hmm. a building. And, you know, I've dealt with some very big, powerful people out there that, you know, you don't even start talking about cursing or, you know, any bad luck or anything because they're petrified that it might actually happen to their projects. Well, exactly. And, I mean, go back to the Macbeth curse. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, that has been longstanding since the time of Shakespeare, and it continues on. And, and no self-respecting actor will say that in a theater because so many bad things have done. I mean, so many bad things have happened, and... People have died. I mean, yeah, Hollywood is, is I think, very superstitious about a lot of things um, because there's so much at stake, I think, financially, that you just don't want to do anything to mess things up. Now, um, you know, it's been said, John, that here in the 21st century, curses are far less harmful than those done way back in medieval times. Now, I'm not sure I agree. What do you think? Again, yes and no. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, today, I think they're they're probably still pretty effective, depending on depending on the individuals that would be doing it and would be causing the problems to act actually occur. Sorry, Marla, I forgot to shut my phone off. <laughs> I usually um, do that, so good. I'm glad it's you. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's something that I think was probably a lot more potent years ago. Why? There was a lot less distractions. There was a lot more energies that were directly focused in comparison to what we have today, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. The but world I mean, was I think simpler they, then. Yes. They, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think the energies and the people that were doing things years ago – were so directly focused on what they were doing and how they were doing it that that energy was extremely powerful. But, I mean, again, today, too, there's still people, uh, practitioners out there that still have that capability and they still have the that energy that is harnessed. But I don't think it it's the same as it was years ago. Maybe we're a little bit wiser or, as you said, busier. You know, we don't have the time to dwell on things like that until they hit home. And then it's, yeah. it's a big brouhaha. Um, Reverend Tim wants to know, 
Can people who own haunted locations become influenced by the building itself, such as being negative? I believe so, yes. Um, When you own a, a haunted location and you have a lot of the energies that are in there, you're going to have an influx of a lot of different energy that could come in with individuals. Mm-hmm. And they, they can bring those things in. They can leave energy behind deliberately um, and to actually cause things to escalate. Mm-hmm. So uh, with all haunted locations, that's why... When I hear people tell me, they go, but John, the energy changed in that place. Well, I'm not surprised by that. You know, Mm -hmm. you have people going in and out researching it. Uh, You do different types of things at it. And you're going to have different energies that are going to come in. So a lot of times with these locations, these people have, you know, clearings that are done on the property to uh, help alleviate Uh, some of that negative energy that is brought in and uh, left behind. What would would be your suggestion for someone who is in a place? Um, You know, because sometimes people will move into an apartment or something and times are hard and you can't just pack up and move out. What, what, What would you suggest for people that are in that kind of a situation that they do to try and make things better and, and let it not affect them? Uh, a key factor is, you know, whatever a person's belief system is to start calling in on the positive mm-hmm. um, to try to help to uh, reinforce that. Um, a major problem with uh, apartments, if you have multiple apartments in a building, you don't know what your neighbor's doing. You don't know what your neighbor practices. So sometimes you're stuck between a rock and a hard place where you can go in and, you know, you can have... Uh, all kinds of different things done in an apartment and it's just not going to take and it's not going to work unless the entire building is done. But then again, like I said, you don't know what your neighbor practices or does and that person could come right back in again and open the doors right back up. So that that's a toughie. That's a hard one. Yeah, because it's... We all are affected by the world around us, the people around us, and unfortunately what they're doing. And, um, you know, I mean, from a witchy standpoint, you know, I would say, well, start with smudging, you know, use some sage, birds some sage, do some prayer work, you know, get that white light up. Because I think, I think we have more power than we give ourselves credit for. You know, it, it's like everybody always thinks the bad guys, the demons, the, the devils, um, the negative entities, they have more power than we do. But I, I personally think that's, not right i think we have as much or more you know not that the good guy always wins but you know right but again it it comes right down to the fact that uh people don't understand when dealing with these things i mean any of us in the paranormal field that that get involved with investigations uh the majority of the time you'll have somebody call you up they're hysterical they're screaming get it out of my house get it away from me i don't want to deal with this make it go away Mm-hmm. And that's when it comes into the point where you're trying to teach a person that they need to build up their strength to fight back. Mm-hmm. And they need to be able to do get that because you can go in and do anything. But if you're going to continuously let negative energy rule your environment, it will continuously pull you down. you got to learn to stand up and fight back. Just like with anything else, the paranormal is no different. Absolutely. Um, I've got a question. It may be a silly one, but it's it's still a question. Um, you know, in the paranormal and medical field, uh, medical metaphysical fields, we all learn by experience. Um, we're eager to try new things and techniques, and they say experience is the best teacher. Now, as far as curses are concerned, and I know you have a curious mind, have you ever been attempt, or have you ever been tempted to try one out and see if they really work? No. Do you know why? You, you have you're... to remember, I've been around the paranormal my entire life. <laughs> my uncle and my aunt put the fear into me as far back as I could possibly remember. 
Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, I, th- there's a lot of things that, you, you know, I'll take a step back and I'll look at and realize that the destruction that these things have caused. Mm-hmm. And to me, to tempt fate, as I put it, to me is not worth it. Right. Yeah. Smart man. I've always said you were a smart man, and now you've just proved it again. Um, you know, I'm going to start cursing in a minute because this hour has flown by, but I want to give you the opportunity to kind of fill us in on what you're up to these days and where you're going to be and also give out your website addresses for both your personal site and the museums. Yeah, well, uh, you just go to uh, johnzaffis.com and that'll take you into all my mis- my different sites out there, the museum one. Uh, let's see, yeah, we have March approaching very fast. Um I'll be at St. Albans on the uh, 18th and the 19th in uh, West Virginia. Then the 24th to the 27th, I'll be at Phenomenology in Gettysburg. Um, I'm doing a couple of public uh, libraries here in the Connecticut area. Actually, I will be getting those up on my site tonight. So uh, there will be a few places I'll be be popping around in the month of March, and we'll have them posted up on the site. You're all over the place, and thankfully... Because um, you're somebody in this field that is like top of your game, well respected, and um, it's good that you're out there. Honestly, I don't know, Marla. It depends on what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, yeah, I hear that too. <laughs> Absolutely. So, okay, guys, here's a warning: do not catch John on a bad day, and 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 always put protection around you before you walk into a room with him. That'll kind of save everything. All right, well, John, I really want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to pop in, and please come back at some point because there's so many different things we can talk about, and I learn a lot from you, so it's a really good thing. And um, stay on the line, if you will, um, when we leave so I can thank you properly. But in the meantime, I want to thank everybody for listening in. And next week, speaking of curses and haunted items, we're going to be visiting with Pamela Sieber, who is the manager of the East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida, and her pal, Robert the Doll. So until next week, everyone, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. tuning in to this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited.